Welcome to the first episode in a brand new series where we'll be exploring the electric nature of our own solar system. First up, we will examine our largest planet, Jupiter. It is named after the Roman god Jupiter. Now, Jupiter is visible to the naked eye and only the Moon and Venus are brighter in the night sky. Through the advent of telescopes we were able to see that Jupiter had satellites of its own. The largest Ganymede is actually bigger than Mercury. In total Jupiter has 79 moons and it also has a very faint small ring system. Jupiter is the fifth planet from our Sun and it is the largest in our solar system. It is one thousandth the mass of the Sun. But don't let that fool you. If you were to combine the mass of all the other planets, Jupiter would still outweigh them by two and a half times. This is why it has such a huge effect on the orbits of the other planets. It is a gas giant composed of about 75% hydrogen and 25% helium. And it is almost identical in its makeup to the Sun. It is believed that Jupiter has a solid core but it lacks a clearly defined solid surface. In 1955, astronomers pointed a radio telescope at Jupiter and they were amazed that they detected radio emissions coming from the planet. And these bursts were in the range of 10 to 40 megahertz. They wanted to work out where these signals came from, so they decided to compare the signal variation to the rotation of the planet. But in order to do this, they would have to work out what the rotation rate of the planet was. And as it had no solid surface, they had to use the clouds as a reference. And from this, they estimated that the rotation rate of Jupiter was a surprising 10 hours. Now, the signals seemed to correlate to specific locations on the planet, and therefore it must be dependent on whether it was facing us. As they continued to make careful measurements over time, it seemed that the location was actually drifting. And from this they realized that their initial assumption about the rotation speed of Jupiter was incorrect. And what is also remarkable about these radio emissions is that it didn't match any visible surface cloud feature, such as the Great Red Spot. They also noticed that the radio emissions were polarized and this implied that there was a strong magnetic field present. And this was the first evidence that Jupiter had a magnetic field. And this also implied that whatever was creating the radio source was coming from deep within Jupiter, where the magnetic field was being created. Now electrons are being accelerated and moved in spirals around the magnetic field lines, causing these radio emissions. Now Io plays an important role in Jupiter's magnetic configuration. It is close enough to Jupiter to feel a huge flexing due to the gravitational effects, and this causes huge volcanic eruptions. This ejected material leaves Io and quickly becomes ionized, and once it's ionized it follows the magnetic field lines and forms a vast torus around Jupiter called the Io torus. As Io's atmosphere is highly ionized, its movement through the magnetic field of Jupiter will have a dramatic effect on these emissions. And as Io moves through the magnetic field, a current will be induced which will oppose the one that caused it. As Io sweeps past, this current it generates actually disturbs the magnetic field of Jupiter and it lasts for some time after Io has passed. And this electric current carries several million amps of current with a potential difference of up to 400,000 volts. In recent years, it has been discovered that Jupiter emits radio frequencies above 100 MHz due to the energetic electrons moving at relativistic speeds close to the planet's equator. Up until now, we believed that uh, these magnetic fields that the planets in our solar system had were fixed, very much like our own. But obviously we know that our magnetic field wanders and at the moment it is undergoing one of those cycles. Now NASA managed to actually determine that Jupiter's field is changing too. Using data from Pioneer 10, Voyager 1 and Juno, they compared the magnetic field over this time period. And they discovered that Jupiter's magnetic field 
was fluctuating. Now they speculate that there is a strong magnetic hotspot called the Great Blue Spot which could be responsible for causing this variation. They believe that this Great Blue Spot could be caused by strong storms around this point extending deep down into Jupiter's surface. Jupiter's magnetic field is mighty. It is 14 times stronger than Earth's and its magnetic moment is 20,000 times stronger than Earth's and has an opposite polarity. But our Sun is still the king, which is about a thousand times stronger than Jupiter's. Both Earth and Jupiter's magnetospheres are tilted to their spin axis by about 10 degrees. Other satellites of Jupiter actually also have their own magnetic fields, for example Ganymede and Io. Now when we look at Jupiter's auroras, they are about a hundred to a thousand times stronger than the ones that we experience on Earth. Now these auroral emissions are so powerful that we actually see them in both X-ray and far ultraviolet visible light and near infrared wavelengths. Jupiter is the only planet to emit synchrotron radiation. It is not fully understood how Jupiter is able to produce X-ray emissions in the first place. Recent observations from the Chandra satellite revealed that the X-rays produced could only have been generated by accelerating oxygen atoms to such a high speed that as they collide with the atmosphere, all eight electrons are stripped off. The North and the South auroras have recently been discovered to pulse independently from each other. The South Pole consistently pulses every 11 minutes, but the X-rays seen from the North Pole are erratic, seemingly independent of the South Pole. And this makes Jupiter very unusual. All other aurora observed so far show mirror images on each of the North and the South side. So this is a real mystery. Now Jupiter has the largest planetary atmosphere in our solar system, spanning over 5,000 kilometers in depth. The outer atmosphere is clearly segregated into several bands at different latitudes, resulting in turbulence at their boundaries. Jupiter is perpetually covered with clouds composed of ammonia crystals. And the orange and the brown coloration in the clouds are caused by compounds which are forced upwards through convection cells which then react with ultraviolet light causing the colour change. The best known weather feature is obviously the Great Red Spot. It is a persistent anti-cyclonic storm that is larger than Earth. It was first observed in 1831 but there is evidence to suggest that it might even have been observed as early as 1665. In recent times, the size of the storm has significantly reduced. In 1979, it measured some 23,000 kilometers in width. And then when it was measured in 1995, it had shrunk to just under 21,000 kilometers. And in 2015, it measured only 16 and a half thousand kilometers in width. Now scientists have recently discovered by studying nearly 40 years worth of data that there are cyclic weather patterns around Jupiter's equator. Every seven years the cloud cover completely clears for about 12 to 18 months and then it returns again. And the clouds are formed by columns of ammonia gas rising at the equator and condensing to form the white clouds at the equator. It is not clear what drives this process but it helps to build a picture of slow weather patterns and climate variations on Jupiter. It is not entirely clear how Jupiter was formed, but when we observe Jupiter and its orbit, it has two groups of Trojan meteors which follow it in its orbit. And this again leads credence to Alvin's jet stream mechanism for the formation of planets. Now near the magnetopause, the flow of the solar wind causes a plasma flow. Now Jupiter actually emits about 1.6 times as much energy as it receives from the Sun. It is believed that this radiation is blackbody radiation, in other words leftover heat energy from its initial formation radiating outwards. So is it possible that life could actually exist on Jupiter?
Jupiter's surface temperature reaches a chilly minus 108 degrees centigrade. As you drop down lower into the clouds, that temperature would start to rise. On Earth, we know there are bacteria called extremophiles, which can exist in some of the harshest conditions ever, where we thought life could never exist. And these temperatures range from a sizzling 121 degrees centigrade to a chilly minus 20 degrees centigrade. So is it possible that life could exist in the clouds on Jupiter? Well, certainly the chemical composition in the clouds could harbour an exotic type of life. Temperatures would be warm enough and flashes from lightning could provide the energy that drives the chemical reaction needed for life. The problem is that they would have to stay at an exact altitude. Rise too high and the temperatures would drop and they would freeze to death. Drop too low and the temperatures would rise and they would burn to death. And the problem is if we look at the atmosphere of Jupiter, there is a lot of turbulence. There's a lot of updrafts and downdrafts and very strong winds. So it is extremely unlikely that these uh, life forms could stay at that particular altitude long enough to effectively survive. There are, however, more likely places to find life around Jupiter. Both Europa and Ganymede have large salty oceans hidden under a thick crust of solidified ice. Now in Ganymede's case, it actually contains more water than on Earth. And this is quite interesting because when we originally started looking outside of planet Earth, we considered water to be a very scarce resource. But the more that we explore space, the more that we find water exists everywhere. And water is a prime ingredient for life as we know it on Earth. So how do we connect all of these facts together in an electric universe? Well, we know that our sun creates its own solar cycle. The sun also outputs a solar wind which is continuously interacting with the planets. Part of the solar circuit is a giant current sheet. The planets will move in and out of this current sheet as they orbit around the sun. These interactions mean that electrical energy has to be transferred between the solar circuit and the planets. We already know that this occurs here on Earth and it is what drives the aurora and many other phenomena including our own weather. Now, Jupiter shows some of the most extreme aurora in our solar system. Finding X-ray emissions from these aurora should therefore not be a surprise to us. We already know that double layers are capable of accelerating particles at relativistic speeds, given enough energy. It is believed that the internal structure of Jupiter may consist of metallic hydrogen, and this means that currents are very probably flowing within the internal structure of Jupiter. Now, it could be these currents which are responsible for generating Jupiter's magnetic field. And the recent discovery of a massive disturbance to Jupiter's magnetic field may indicate that something special is going on within the structure of these currents flowing within the core of Jupiter. It may also indicate that the planets are moving through a change in the current sheet of the solar system. And it too may also indicate that our solar system is moving through a change in the galactic current sheet. And it is no surprise to see that changes here on Earth are being mirrored by changes on the other planets. Now the radio emissions are caused obviously by electrons flowing across the equator in the core and generating these radio waves. Again, more proof that a current system is active within Jupiter. Is it not more likely that Jupiter is acting in some ways very much like our own Sun? On the Sun, the solar circuit drives the potential in the star, causing tufting, which we see on the photosphere. Now, Jupiter is not large enough and does not have enough driving potential to cause this tufting on the surface. But these processes will still cause the same movement of charge and one of the effects we would see is radio emissions. And interesting enough, when we compare the radio image of the Sun, we see radio hotspots all along the equator. And that's exactly what we see on Jupiter. 
though this would also explain why Jupiter emits 1.6 times the amount of energy that it receives. This is again explained by the fact that the Jovian circuit is active, being driven by the solar circuit. In the north and the south pole of Jupiter, not only do we see strong aurora, we see very unusual storm patterns. Now if we look at both of these images of the north and the south pole, what you will see is a very regular structure of storm clouds. And it is quite interesting because we don't see a similar pattern on Earth. Could this be the effect of the incoming Birkeland current from the Sun? Potentially it could also be the incoming current from the Io Taurus. We know that as Io sweeps around it generates a huge amount of current and that current is fed back into the poles of Jupiter. So again that effect could also be what we see here. The fact that you have that incoming current and does it arrange itself like a Birkeland current? Is that Birkeland current potentially helical in structure? and therefore we see this repeated pattern on the surface of Jupiter. Now again, on top of this, we also see when we observe the uh, direction of the clouds, we see counter rotation at the North and the South Pole, but we equally see that throughout the whole planet. Um, that doesn't necessarily imply that it is a Birkeland current, but obviously when we look at the Markland convection, that's what we would expect to say, but I'm not suggesting that this is necessarily a Markland convection. And on a final note, I would like you to actually listen to the sound of Jupiter. This is recorded using the Juno probe as it entered Jupiter's bow shock. Now, it was obviously recording the radio waves and these have been converted into sound, a bit like, I guess, listening to your radio. And for me, when I listen to it, it reminds me of sort of a forest, a very sort of happy, uh, peaceful sound to me anyway. I hope you found this an insightful journey into the solar system's giant. As always, be brave, be curious, the truth is waiting for us. Until next time.